Hi guys, this is Tanoi Sinha, and you are watching a Civ 4 Beyond the Sword playthrough. We are currently playing the Native American Civ on a Pangea map, looking for an Emperor level start. And we have a ton to talk about in this segment, so I'm going to jump right in. First off, at the end of the last segment, we ran into the Vedic Aryans. And they are quite a doozy to deal with. It's several archers near one of your cities very early in the game. And we had quite a healthy bit of luck. Um, when we tried to fight them off, we basically killed four archers with just a warrior, a dog soldier, and another dog soldier that ended up suiciding. And a lot of times in Civ 4, you can be uh, in situations where the random number generator gives you a bad event or some sort of situation where the odds are stacked against you. And it can be very easy to focus on how unlucky you are and just throw your hands up in the air and say, you know, I'm going to lose the game, whatever. Um, that's something that you really want to shy away from because in every situation in Civ 4, there's something, however small, that you can do to improve your odds. In our case, we went into slavery, we whipped out a unit very quickly, we tried to figure out the best attacks that we could use to give us ourselves the best chance of winning, and we ended up getting some nice die rolls in our favor, and we ended up keeping Poverty Point. If you end up staying focused in, in situations where you get bad luck in Civ 4, you're going to win more games in the long run even if it means you got a little bit lucky now and then. It's very important to stay focused whenever that kind of thing happens. The next couple things that we need to think about are our future expansion plans, research plans, and diplomacy plans. We'll talk about research first. There are lots of options for you in the early mid game and the options are not as concrete as in the early game. So we'll just run through quickly a couple options. First there's literature for the Great Library. This is a wonder strategy, and it has all the caveats of a wonder strategy. You know, you can lose the library to another civilization, something like that. Um, but the Great Library is probably one of the strongest wonders in the whole game. It basically will pop every great scientist that you want between now and the scientific method. That's a huge number of great scientists, and it can really jumpstart your game no matter what your endgame victory goals are. So very powerful, highly recommend getting it. However, in our particular case, we don't have the strongest fundamentals, we don't have good terrain, and we don't necessarily have enough defense to beeline a research tech here. So, we're going to skip that. Construction is another option. It's the premier warmonger technology. allows you to get the catapult. And with enough catapults, even like a lowly archer can take over a city. They're just simply the best city attacking units in the whole game. And construction should be highly prioritized if you plan on going to war. But it's a very narrow technology, and I'm not convinced entirely that we absolutely have to go to war. So we're going to skip construction. Alphabet is another option. It allows you to tech trade, which is a great benefit to your scientific research. Um, every technology that you get, you can trade for some other technology, and that acts as sort of like a bigger multiplier. If you trade writing for something, you get you can get up to like a 50 to 100 percent multiplier on those 187 beakers that you've researched. So tech trading is very powerful. You definitely want to get it pretty soon. But I'm not as worried about science with our start. I'm more worried about our terrain. And I'm more worried about our defense. So we're going to skip alphabet. And we're going to go ahead and go with ironworking. This is because it allows you to remove jungle, which we will need to uh, do to this city, Poverty Point, to make it more productive. It also gets the gems online. And the second thing we need to do is uh, try to reveal iron and get some swordsmen out. Currently we're relying on dog soldiers, which aren't the best units um, for attacking other cities. And if we do want to go to war, which we might have to do to get out of our poor land situation, we're going to want swordsmen. So this keeps our options open. It allows us to get some economy online while giving us the ability to go to war later on if we need to. So ironworking is probably the best bet. We might go to metal casting next. This is because it gives us the forge. And forges are good if you have a hammer-heavy start. We have plenty of forests and hills around our starting locations. So it's really important for us to make those hammers work for us as efficiently as possible. So that's one reason to get a forge. The other reason is we have gems, gold, and silver nearby. So that's an additional three happy faces from the forge. And that's huge. So we definitely want to get that online as quickly as possible. So that's our research path. Next is diplomacy. And there are two main things you want to figure out with diplomacy. First, you want to have a clear strategy towards all of the people uh, on your map as soon as possible. This is because civilizations will be asking you to do certain things for them randomly during turns on in your playthrough. So, for example, Isabella could come to me and say, stop trading with Shaka. And you want to know what your strategy is in, di in diplomacy because you're going to get demerits with one or the other based on that request. 
you want to make sure you have the right ally and you're not just choosing indiscriminately. Uh, if you choose indiscriminately, you might get demerits with Isabella and Shaka and then eventually destroy your chances of diplomacy with anybody. You at least want to have some allies in every game, so make sure you have a clear strategy. The best way to pick that strategy is to understand some of the idiosyncrasies of the AI. So, one way to do that is just to play against them a lot, and then you'll come up with things like, you know, Isabella is fairly religious, Shaka is fairly mil militaristic, and you can pick those up the more you play. You can also be a little bit more precise and look at XML values. XML is just a kind of file that Civilization 4 uses to determine the AI predispositions of each one of its Civilization's leaders. So I'll give you an example. There are numbers that determine whether Willem Van Orange, um, when he will go to war, uh, what kind of things he likes to build, how, how often he decides to build units, um, when he will start talking to you after you get involved in a war with him. All of these have very explicit values, and you can go to a site like SIFFanatics.com. They have strategy guides there that list out all of these values. That can be very effective for you if you're confused and, and you need to learn something about a new Civ very quickly. Um, you can really use that to guide your diplomatic um, gameplay. I don't uh, do too much research on civs, but I get a general idea of some of the more important variables. One variable that's very important is when the civ will declare war on you. Willem Van Orange is unique in that he's one of the few civs that will declare on you at pleased. So you think you can have a great relationship with Willem Van Orange, and then out of nowhere, he declares on you, and now you're at war. So he can totally backstab you. That's something you need to keep in mind. That makes him our number one priority. We will probably give in to all of his demands, and we will try to adopt Hinduism if it comes up, so that we get on his good side sooner rather than later. So he's our number one priority. Number two is de Gaulle. This is because he's close to us, he builds good units, he's a decent warmonger, and really the only reason he's not as high as Willem van Orange is that Willem will declare it pleased, and de Gaulle, I believe, declares it cautious. So we have a bit more of a cushion with de Gaulle, but we definitely, uh, he's our second highest priority. We'll, we will probably give in to all of his demands, and we will probably open borders with him as well. Our third priority is Shaka. He is a military powerhouse. He builds a lot of units, and he knows how to use them. You never want to get on his bad side, no matter where he is. The only reason he is not as high a priority as de Gaulle or Willem van Orange is because I don't really know where he is. He's probably on the other side of the map. That said, he's our third priority. We will probably give in to all of his demands, but we will not make it a priority to open borders with him uh, too soon. So there's Shaka. Hannibal is a pretty decent leader as well. He's number four. And he's really concerning uh, towards the end game when you start to think about victory conditions. He's a guy who can clearly run away with the game, and uh, when you're trying to figure out how you want to win, you want to make sure you have a strategy in place for uh, the situation where Hannibal runs away with the game. It's entirely possible. He's a great teker. Um, other than that, I'm not concerned with him because he's not close to us, so he will be our fourth priority. We will probably turn down some of his demands if they seem like they are too uh, uh, ridiculous or if he's asking for ironworking or something like that. We probably won't give in to that. Our last priority is Isabella. She's just a religious nutcase. There's really no other way to put it. She is very easy to get on your good side. Just pick her religion. If you don't pick her religion, she'll really hate you. But she has a tendency to be kind of insular in who she hates, so if you just make sure that she dislikes somebody a little bit more than she dislikes you, she'll probably worry about that guy, go to war with him, and you won't ever have to see her the entire game. 